Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My, na my name is Dave Haverse. I'm the CEO of uh, TPA, and I, I have the honor to uh, introduce you to uh, our conference, uh, our webinar of today on Diverted Profit Tax. I have with me uh, Zoe White. She's a director at, uh, at our alliance, Milestones in, in London, and Igor Peters, who is also a partner of TPA out of the Amsterdam office. Uh, topic is quite interesting today. It, it is um, uh, following uh, quite a few uncertainties on diverted profit tax as uh, as one measure to uh, as one example of a unilateral BAPS measure taken in this case by HMRC, um, the uh, uh, structure of the conference uh, of one hour will be as follows. If you have any questions, you can type out the questions in the go to meet uh, screen you have in front of you. Um, we'll be taping this version and on our YouTube um, um, channel of uh, on, on TPA TPA's website. Uh, the, the topic, just as an introduction, will be about tax leakage and the, and the way HMRC has um, has tacked it is by taking very BAPS BAPS like terminology like uh, the lack of economic substance and the avoidance APE permanent establishment. But the, the flavor, the local flavor HMRC has given to this legislation is quite uh, particular and is stepping away quite, uh, uh, quite, quite drastically from the, the measures and the concepts we know under OECD guidelines on transfer pricing and international taxation. So if we, if we Look at the agenda of today. The, the 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 main questions we want to address is the question why uh, why this rule uh, set of rules is being published uh, when you will not be uh, vulnerable and uh, and and uh, subject to this diverted profit tax. The how is a very important question. So how do you apply this in practice? And we uh, we will highlight each of these steps with uh, with practical examples. And then uh, last but not least, how do you actually report your positions? You uh, you you um, assess you have a diverted profit tax to uh, to the tax inspector in the UK, and and what is the payment schedule around it? We have some. Uh, some examples attached. We will weave the examples into the uh, the presentation and agenda as we go forward. I, I would like uh, to go to the next slides and invite uh, Zoe to uh, uh, to take us through the background and uh, and the follow up on that. Uh, Zoe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Fig. So the DPT is the UK government's response to the public view that big business doesn't pay its so-called fair share of tax, and also to the general consensus that existing rules such as transfer pricing and the permanent establishment definition do not go far enough in protecting the UK tax base. So the DPT has been introduced to effectively override the application of the transfer pricing regime to related party payments and the existing UKP definition. We actually only received draft legislation back in December and following a very brief consultation, we had the final legislation on the 25th of March this year, which became effective just one week later on the 1st of April. So for groups with accounting periods falling on or after the 1st of April, they will now need to consider how the new DPT rules apply. Effectively, if a group has diverted profits, and we'll have a look at how diverted profits arise shortly, they will be subject to a punitive tax of 25%, so 5% higher than the current UK corporation tax rate. Zoe, why, why didn't the uh, UK not wait for the outcome of all the BEPS action plans? Well, uh, you, you're, you're right. The, the, the issues that we're looking at here are, are covered by the, the action plans that, that BEPS is currently considering, and the, the UK has jumped the gun on this. Uh, the, the main reason is that we have a general election in, I think, two weeks today it is. Uh, if, they, if the government hadn't put this on the agenda and hadn't done something, uh, the opposition party would have, would have had the opportunity to, to attack the current 
the current government. So it's completely uh, politically motivated. Um, but equally, it's potentially an indication that there's not um, complete trust in the best process or the time frame within which the, the outcomes will, will arise. And other uh, countries? Are you aware of uh, copying? Yeah, we understand that Australia are, are looking closely at the DPT uh, and how it's going to work here in the UK. And um, we're expecting them to draw something similar. However, we are also expecting that it will go through a much longer consultation process. And, and this is partly because of the way in which Australia brings in or gives effect to its double tax treaties, uh, which is, is different to the way which we do it here. Um, and so their concern is that um, if they were to bring in a carbon copy of our DPT, that actually their double tax treaties would override this. So I think Australia will follow suit, but it will take a, a bit longer. Okay, yeah, interesting. Yeah, sounds like a treaty override, but perhaps we should discuss that um, at the end if we have some uh, time left. Sure. Uh, did you want me to mention about treaty override now, or we can come from a UK perspective, or we can come back to it? Uh, yeah, let's save it for uh, the end. So, okay. so the next slide I propose. Okay, good. So. Um, it's probably easiest to start with who the rules don't apply to. So there is an exemption for large groups or large enterprises, and say only one party to a relevant transaction under consideration needs to be large. So when we look at the, the main charging provisions, you'll see that there are transactions between um, connected parties. Only, only one of them needs to be large uh, for, to be within the DPT regime. Uh, transactions with completely independent agents are not subject to the DPT, so those transactions can be disregarded when considering how this applies. We also have an exemption where UK-related sales revenue is 10 million or less, and you're applying this on a group basis. So uh, if you have a group that has uh, provides goods and also services, and, and they're fragmented into separate entities, you are looking at both of the entities' uh, UK sales total when you're looking at the 10 million. Even if you do have sales revenue over 10 million, you can still potentially escape a chart of being within the regime if your UK-related expenses are 1 million or less. So we're talking about um, salaries, overhead, etc. And for the, the remainder of these slides, we will assume that none of these exemptions are available, so I don't have to talk about them again. So there are two key charging provisions, and the first is looking at entities or transactions lacking economic substance. I think the title of this provision is a bit misleading, because as we go on, you'll see that actually it doesn't really care much for substance in the traditional sense, so looking at where functions, assets, and risks are located, and we'll come on to that in a bit more detail shortly. When assessing whether charging provision one applies to you, the key question is whether a UK company has made a payment to a foreign connected party. And that can be either directly or indirectly through um, a series of other UK companies. If this is the case, then you must consider how the DPT will ap apply. And it's interesting because this particular provision isn't just limited to looking at the payment from the UK company to a foreign company but any subsequent payments that foreign company makes. So you can see from the diagrams on the slide, not just where UK Co. is making a payment to foreign Co., but also looking at when foreign Co. is on making other payments to other related parties. Okay. And can, can you tell more? When, when is uh, charging provision uh, one applicable? So as I said, uh, all you need is a UK company to be making a payment to a foreign connected party. The next question is whether a tax saving arises from this payment. So for example, you'll get a UK tax deduction at 20% uh, in respect to that payment, and where there was no tax on receipt in the foreign territory, then you'd have a 20% tax saving. If, however, you had, let's say, 5% um, withholding tax on that payment from the UK to the foreign company, then you'd, your tax saving would reduce by 5%. So you're looking at your UK deduction, any withholding taxes, and then the tax paid in the foreign territories. So 
Does the amount of the tax saving matter? Well, yes, because we have what's called an 80% test, and you can potentially escape the DPT if the tax saving is at least 80% of the UK tax reduction. So in other words, any withholding tax or any foreign tax together would need to be at a, an effective 16% tax rate in order to get, escape the charge. So there's one more chance to escape the DPT uh, and this provision applying, and that's if the insufficient economic subsidies is not set. And again, this is the misleading part of, of this provision, because it doesn't require the taxpayer to, pay to evidence that they have economic substance in the recipient territories through looking at the, the function of assets and risk, but instead it requires the taxpayer to quantify a non-tax financial benefit. So looking at the, the financial benefits it has from, say, for example, a centralized model, but discounting any uh, any tax benefits that arise. And so all of these, the, the points I'm talking about here, so your payment to a connected party, your tax saving, your 80% test, and your insufficient economic substance condition, you should note that they all sit within what's called the effective tax mismatch condition. So when you're looking at the legislation, that, that's where you're, you're headed for. Zoe, so question uh, from one of our attendees. Will the diverted profit tax also be applicable to residents of the Isle of Man? Yes. So, um, well, I think the question, really you're looking at UK companies. Um, so when we're looking at charging provision one, we're looking at a UK company making a payment to a foreign company. Now, if that foreign company were in the Isle of Man, then yes, you would be looking at, at that relationship. But the Isle of Man doesn't form part of the UK for corporation tax purposes. So uh, if you just had an Isle of Man company in your group and no other connection with the UK, and the Isle of Man company paid, made a payment to a connected party, then that wouldn't be within the regime. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah, to me. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So... Next slide. Thank you. So there are a number of ways to quantify a non-tax financial benefit, and it's probably going to be a labor-intensive process and will require looking at the, the supply chain and, and where the value sits. Uh, and one way may be to look at the economies of scale, for example, from a, a centralized model uh, and coming up with certain assumptions and methodologies to quantify that. Uh, Igor, I think you, you may have an example for us. Yeah, I think the yeah, easiest example would be a centralized purchase uh, hub, uh, which which not merely uh, collects volume discounts, but really has expertise and knowledge in order to uh, get price reductions from from well, let's say from five to ten percent. Uh, in that way, you would be uh, able to uh, quantify uh, non-financial benefit, and I think that's something we would be able to do, of course, for the other uh, functions and uh, efficiency gains. Yeah. I, I don't think this quantifying the non-tax financial benefit can be underestimated. In some earlier conversations that I were, was having with some groups, that they uh, had also they received some advice to effectively bypass this condition and, and head to the, the next test, which we'll look at shortly. And I think if you can quantify a non-tax financial benefit, and if it exceeds your tax benefit, uh, and if it significantly exceeds your tax benefit, then you have no reporting obligation um, and you're not within the regime. So if you can come up with these methodologies to, to quantify this, then, then my view is you should absolutely take that approach. Of course, in doing so, you will make assumptions. So you may wish to, in any event, share your uh, approach and your um, analyses with, with the revenue specialist DPT team. Yeah, just um, just to make it uh, practical uh, for for the audience as well. If you look at purchasing power, and let's assume you have a purchasing hub in in Singapore, Switzerland, uh, Hong Kong, any any of these locations, which uh, would create a savings of uh, between five and ten percent uh, of the free on board value of procured goods uh, by the UK. 
that that would typically classify as a non-financial, uh, 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 sorry, a non-tax financial benefit. Um, I think that's a, that's a clear one. And if you if you add more supply chain expertise in that uh, centralized hub outside the UK, I guess the UK will benefit from that as well. Uh, another example I, I'm I'm interested in uh, to hear uh, the view uh, because it's a lot harder to justify the benefits is a brand fee. So if you charge a brand fee, fee say from um, a, a place in uh, in, in uh, Singapore to the UK, how can you then? Differentiate that the UK entity actually gets a benefit from that because that, I'm, I'm looking at you, Zoe. That, that that is not an easy game because you almost have to say to the to the tax inspector that because you use the brand, you're able to premium price your services or goods in a certain way to to create a a quantification of that non-tax financial benefit. Any yeah. you're, you're absolutely right. It, when you're just paying a fee for a use of a trademark or brand, it's going to be a lot harder to quantify the, the non-tax non financial benefits. Okay. Okay, so in summary, where a UK company makes a payment to a foreign connected party, the results in a tax saving and you're failing the 80% test and you're unable to quantify a non-tax financial benefit, then charging provision one applies. Okay. So, so in terms of what to do next, the, the, a group must assess whether a DPT charge actually then arises. And in order to do this, the group must identify what is known as the alternative provision which is essentially the transaction that would have taken place if tax had not been a relevant consideration. So it's so quite a wide uh, test. Um, one example that the, the revenue provides in their guidance is uh, of a UK trading company with a foreign parent, and the UK trading company needs to purchase some plant and machinery. Instead of the UK company purchasing the plant and machinery, the foreign parent sets up a company in a low-tax territory to purchase and then lease the plant machinery back to the UK. The HMRC guidance considers that the alternative transaction, so in absence of any tax considerations, would be that the UK company would have purchased the plant and machinery itself. So there would be no deduction for the UK company in respect of the lease payments that it had made. So that full amount is your diverted profit, the full amount of the lease payment. Uh, nonetheless, you can, it does suggest that you can uh, reduce that amount with any notional capital allowances that you would have received if the UK had purchased the plant and machinery itself. The, the issue with the HMRC guidance with examples like this is that they're quite narrow and they don't consider, for example, uh, in, in, in this case, uh, the scenario where the foreign company purchasing the plant and machinery does so for all trading companies on a European or, or global basis. I think if that were the case, it's arguable that, there, that the alternate provision would actually be the same as the actual provision that takes place. Unfortunately, even where the alternative provision is the same, you're not home and dry. Uh, you may still find that there are diverted profits as a result of what's called the artificially inflated expense condition. So this would apply where the company receiving the payment has no substance in terms of people, functions, assets, and risks. So finally, we actually get to look at where, where our functions and assets and risks are located. Um, the example provided in the HMRC guidance in this regard is where a UK company makes a royalty payment to a foreign company, which is in turn paid on to another foreign connected company and located in a tax haven. And the tax haven company owns the IP, but there is only uh, nominal personnel um, and they're responsible for just holding, maintaining, and protecting the IP. So there's no active exploitation in the IP code. And where this is the case, the royalty will be considered to be artificially inflated and subject to an arbitrary 30% restriction. So this means that 
for example, if the UK paid a royalty of 10 million to the foreign company, it will be deemed to pay a royalty of just 7 million, and the difference of 3 million will be subject to the diverted profits tax at 25%. Next slide. Okay, and what can we do to mitigate this charge? Following on the last example, one option would be where you have a the inflated expense would be to uh, make a transfer pricing adjustment so that actually instead of paying a 10 million royalty, you effectively have paid a, a 7 million royalty. Now this means that 3 million difference, instead of being taxed at the DPT 25% rate, will be subject to normal UK corporation tax at 20%. Of course, uh, that same income uh, won't necessarily have been adjusted in the recipient territory, so you could end up with tax there and potentially double tax. Okay, with uh, tax credit. Yeah, the tax credit is, is interesting, actually. When we, we first had the draft legislation uh, back in December, there was no opportunity for, uh, to be able to credit the foreign tax. And this was because the view is that diverted profits tax isn't corporation tax. So how can you credit uh, corporation tax suffered in another territory? Uh, but following a, a lot of um, uh, pressure from, from the tax profession and, uh, and uh, taxpayers, it's been adjusted so that foreign tax credit is available if it is just and reasonable uh, to, to give the credit. So uh, in, in the example that we're talking about here, we would expect the credit to be available. Okay, that, that's more a uh, short-term uh, solution. And any longer-term solutions? This will really depend on its own facts and circumstances. So uh, following on from the royalty example uh, on the previous slide, one restructuring option could be to carve out the UK rights from the IP and locate these in a territory that is actually actively exploiting the IP. And carving out the UK rights in this way may stop the artificially inflated expense restriction for that 30% restriction applying. And it also potentially protects against the claim from another taxing authority that their local return should be higher. So the concern is if you start making a transfer pricing adjustment for the UK, that one of your other um, uh, trading companies in, in another high tax territory that say, Germany, France, or, or wherever, turn around and say, well, why, why aren't we getting more? So carving out the UK rights is potentially one option. OK, far, far-fetching uh, effects of these uh, legislation. Yes, absolutely. Uh, next slide. So that was charging provision one. We still have to think about charging provision two. Uh, this is looking at the concept of an artificially avoided PE. So charging provision two is asking whether it's reasonable to assume that a foreign company has taken steps designed to avoid a UK PE. So this could be by artificially restricting the activity of a connected company. So for example, uh, not allowing it to conclude customer contracts but perhaps allowing it to support in the negotiation of those contracts or the sourcing of customers or um, uh, general marketing in, in the UK. You should note that when applying this test, this reasonable test, uh, commercial or any other objectives are to be disregarded. So that said, having an avoided PE is not enough on its own to be within the DPT regime. Uh, it's necessary to either have also a tax avoidance motive or the effective tax mismatch condition must be met. So um, just to explain a bit more about those two, two kind of additional conditions, you've got the, the diagram on the side, so the, the diagram on the left, um, you've got foreign company, no other group companies, uh, just the UK sales and marketing entity and uh, it's restricted the activity of the sales and marketing entity so that it's only allowed to help solicit uh, new customers, but it can't conclude contracts and it can only negotiate within certain parameters. Where this is the case and where your foreign company does not have any other payments to any connected parties, then you only need to meet the tax, uh, tax avoidance motive. So you have to ask yourself, if 
the reason for the, the foreign company in the UK sales and marketing company being structured in this way uh, is with, because or the main purpose or one of the main purpose is, is tax avoidance. And I think having this, this main or main purpose test, uh, it comes into a lot of UK legislation and this potentially gives you the opportunity to pick up those commercial decisions, those commercial rationale for being structured this way that we have to disregard when we're applying the first part of this test. Um, um, Zoe, a, a question, uh, this, or a question more remark. This, this sounds like uh, any foreign corp in the middle in, the, in this slide 11, which is a centralized business model using the UK as its sales arm, having on the other side the equation contract R&D, contract manufacturing, uh, centralized mo business model is fully subject to this provision. I presume yeah. from the, that perspective. Yeah, the, the legislation, as you can see, the wording on the side, is absolutely wide enough to, um, to, to capture that type of model. But you'll see when we come on to the HMRC guidance in a moment that it, it, it uh, att attempts to, I believe, narrow um, the legislation itself. But we'll, we'll look at that in just a moment. So um, we've talked about having an avoided PE and the tax avoidance motive. If, however, your uh, foreign company with the potentially avoided UK PE, if it makes a payment to another connected party, then it doesn't matter whether you have a tax avoidance motive or not. You have to actually go on to consider the effective mismatch condition, which we've already looked at in the context of the, the first charging provision. Okay, and is there any guidance on what is then exactly an avoided PE? Yes, so um, uh, just, I mean, just before we get on to the guidance, it's probably worth explaining why the effective mismatch condition is here. Because where, where a foreign company has avoided a UK PE, it must allocate profits to that avoided PE on a just and reasonable basis. Now, if the foreign company is making payments to other connected parties, its own profit will be less, so there won't be very much to allocate to the UK. So you can think of it as, think of the effective mismatch condition as effectively allowing an adjustment of the foreign company's profits, so notionally adjusting them so there's more to potentially allocate to, to the UK. In terms of uh, the guidance on, on what constitutes an avoided PE, uh, there, there's a number of examples in the uh, revenue guidance. And they also talk about a, a typical principal LRD structure, whereby the principal concludes customer contracts and earns the revenue from UK sales, and also has a UK limited risk distributor whose activities have been deliberately restricted so that it cannot conclude contracts, even though it may help negotiate contracts within parameters set down by the principal. The HMRC guidance goes on to say that following a detailed, detailed examination by an, a HMRC officer, it concludes that whilst there has been a contrived separation of the conclusion of contract from both the selling activity and the process of agreeing terms and conditions, they conclude that no avoided PE arises. The rationale is that this is because the principal is responsible for, in this particular example, for orchestrating sales across Europe by various product promotions. Uh, it manages relationships with the major customers at a European level and actively manages the local LRDs. And on a review, they considered the profit allocation between the principal and the LRD reflected their contribution to the generation of profits from sales to UK customers. Now, this, this was a surprise outcome because, as you saw on the previous slide, clearly, the legislation is wide enough with the, the, the reasonable test uh, to, for there to be an avoided PE. And the example itself talks about there being a contrived separation of the confusion of contracts from, from the uh, negotiating of terms. Uh, so it, it would have made more sense, in my view, for HMRC to conclude that there is an avoided PE but that no diverted profits arise because on a review, all parties were remunerated um, on either transfer pricing or to use the wording of legislation on a just and reasonable basis. So 
what, what can we take from that? It, it, I believe the, the, the HMRC are deliberately trying to narrow the, the legislation itself, and, and potentially they've received um, some pressure from, from UK business. Uh, although that's just speculation, I, I, I add. Um, now, it's helpful, yes, um, to have this guidance, but guidance is just guidance. We've got lots of case law here in the UK that, um, that disregards guidance when it's, when, when it's convenient to do so. And I think my main concern with relying on the guidance would be that we do have an election in a couple of weeks, and if we do have a new government, uh, they could... Um, absolutely direct HMRC to take a different approach. And I think we need to remember that this is only interim guidance, so it is subject to change. So um, I think placing reliance solely on the guidance would be um, would not be the best move, uh, although you could use it absolutely to, to begin your discussions with HMRC. It's also worth noting uh, that if you have any um, recommendations on how the guidance could be changed, or if you have any other examples, the HMRC are quite happy for you to provide those examples, and so can potentially impact what the, the guidance from the final guidance has. So it's worth bearing in mind if you have any particular strong feelings on that. <coughs> um, the next please. So the avoided PE provision gets a little more complex, where the foreign company also makes payments to a connected party, as we have to apply the effective tax mismatch con condition. So we're looking at the same questions as we looked at in charging provision one, in respect of, and we've got an example here on the slide, in, in this case in respect of the Dutch sales company. So we're looking at, again, is there a tax saving? Is the 80% test met? Uh, is the insufficient economic substance test met? And then going on to consider the alternative provision and potentially the artificially inflated expense uh, restriction. So in the example on the diagram, we can see that Dutch Sales Co. has made a royalty payment to a Swiss principal, which is in turn paid to an, an IP Co. in a tax haven. So we, we have to firstly consider whether Sales Co. achieves a tax saving. And to do this, we effectively pretend that Sales Co. is UK resident for the purposes of calculating this test. So its tax reduction would be at a UK corporate tax rate of 20%, and the Swiss tax is 5%. Therefore, there is a tax saving of 15%. Next, we must consider the 80% test. Now, of course, this would require the Swiss tax to be 16% or higher which is clearly not the case here. So we're not going to be able to escape under the 80% test. So next, we must be able to quantify the non-tax financial benefit. And I won't go into any more discussion on that. Um, we talked about that earlier. Um, of course, if the non-tax financial benefit does not exceed the tax saving, then we have to consider what the alternative provision might be. And so for example, the alternative provision here maybe that Sales Co. would have paid the royalty directly to IP Co. as the IP owner. And as we saw before, where there is no active exploitation or protection of that IP in IP Co., then the 30% artificially related expense restriction would apply. Now, of course, in some cases, depending on the facts and circumstances, it is quite possible that HMRC could argue that actually the IP should be held in the UK if, um, for example, the UK was significantly exploiting that IP, uh, they might deem that the IP is actually owned there. So I think the, the point there is that the alternative provision is, is, is who, who decides that. As the taxpayer, you might come up with one option. As an advisor, I might choose something else. And the tax office might come up with a totally different uh, alternative transaction. So. Uh, given that it's so wide that it's the test that, um, or the transaction that would exist if tax would ever be a relevant consideration. So it, it's a bit worrying in how wide that is. Um, and really, it's really possible to really understand the extent of it when you're looking at uh, real facts and circumstances. And again, that's another reason for beginning 
discussions with the revenue potentially early on. Zoe, how open is the HMRC to talk about these issues on, on real cases? Uh, because the, the, the vagueness of some of the rules and the interpretation uh, taking the, the, the regulation so, versus uh, the, the practice seems to be uh, very, uh, very young and, and, and undeveloped, which means it's very hard for a tax inspector to already give a statement on a, on a, a real set of facts. Yeah, it's very true. So um, uh, the revenue have a specialist uh, diverted profits tax team, so they are all focusing on this legislation, so they will be um, the best people to speak to. Uh, most groups uh, that are large will have what is called a customer relationship manager here in the UK, um, and so that would be the starting point to speak to the, their, their CRM, as they're called. Um, my understanding is that I think it was last week that all the CRMs are actually going on, uh, have gone under specific DPT training to, to facilitate those initial discussions. So I think one, the revenue is absolutely expecting that discussion to begin. Um, question how much you can actually, uh, how much certainty you can actually get from the revenue in those discussions. Uh, we do have something called non-statutory clearance here in the UK which effectively allows, when we have a, a new piece of legislation, it allows the taxpayer to approach the, the revenue effectively for an opinion um, up to 18 months to two years after, after the new legislation has come in. And you're, you're allowed to do that if there is sufficient uncertainty in your transaction. <clears throat> and I think that uh, there will be a lot of that in, in the application of the DPT. So, I expect that the revenue will be open to discussions, but before approaching the revenue, I would absolutely consider um, how, how the DPT applies to you and um, come up with a strategy for uh, evidencing uh, how it applies and, uh, and then take your strategy to HMRC. Okay, and anything else which you could do to mitigate the DPT charge? In, in, uh, so, as before, um, you might look to make a TP, TP adjustment in the first relevant accounting period, and for future accounting periods, you may consider actually concluding contracts in the UK. Okay, so is that, does that mean that DPT impact can be mitigated if payments are at arm's length? Um, it's, it's not necessarily about payments being at, at arm's length, and I think maybe on, on this next slide, um, I think you'll be able to see when we kind of effectively, well, if we go to the next slide, I'll talk you through it, and um, I think it will highlight uh, some of the issues around whether payments are, are arm's length or not, um, and, and whether that's helpful. So, once you've decided that you've got an avoided PE, um, and that you can't escape a charge, you have to calculate what your diverted profits tax will be. So, effectively, you start by creating a P&L for the avoided PE. So, <coughs> excuse me. So um, you would start by allocating all UK sales revenue to the UK, less any uh, cost of sales incurred by the foreign company, wholly and exclusively for the purpose of its trade. And then next, you would consider what payments the avoided PE would have paid to connected parties. So. Um, Following on from the earlier example, or the last example, sorry, this will include a fee to the sales company for its role in the supply chain and a fee to any other related parties, so such as the principal or the IP co. The, the size of the fee paid to the connected parties will be impacted by the outcome of both the alternative provision uh, and the inflated expense uh, restriction. The okay. issue here... The issue that um, you can see from the, the slide is that uh, how, do you, how do you quantify what fee should be paid to the connected party? So uh, in the inflated expense restriction, we know that whatever fee uh, was going to them beforehand or their remuneration beforehand is potentially restricted by 30%. But if we disregard the inflated expense restriction and the alternative provision for a moment, and we just look at the allocation of profits on a just and reasonable basis, how, how do you decide what to pay back to your connected parties? Do, 
is it acceptable that they continue to earn uh, the margin that they were already earning under this transaction? Uh, and if that were the case, then you are not necessarily going to increase um, or you're not going to necessarily have any diverted profit because there's nothing additional to add to the UK. So it, it's, it's not exactly clear how you go about doing that because you have this concept of just and reasonable and you are specifically told to disregard transfer pricing when applying that test. Um, the, the concept of just and reasonable is used throughout UK tax legislation but it's not actually defined anywhere. Um, and case law doesn't particularly help here either. Um, the, the concept of just and reasonable is said to be the result that is just and reasonable for both the tax office and the taxpayer. Um, whether that actually happens in practice is a different question and it will no doubt lead to disputes with, with HMRC and, and this is also another reason to start discussions with your um, local CRM or the DPT team early on. Um, one option may be to apply a different transfer pricing methodology, so uh, you're comparing the results of the actual methodology used and uh, perhaps another methodology. So, for example, if the UK is remunerated on a cost plus basis, perhaps you could try to apply the profit split method, and if you yield the same results, you might argue that there's no diverted profits. And if you don't end up with the same margins in the UK, then the difference is potentially your, your diverted profits. But, but I'm applying, I'm suggesting to apply transfer pricing when the, the legislation specifically tells you to disregard it. So it's, um, it's not straightforward. And I was uh, speaking at a conference earlier this week with um, top, uh, four of the uh, top tax barristers in the UK, and none of them could answer this question on how to... to allocate profits on a just and reasonable basis. So I think it's up to the taxpayer to come up with, a, with their own suggestions, for example, using this alternative transfer pricing methodology and then testing it with HMRC. Zoe, uh, just to, to frame that example, uh, because this, uh, this diverted profit tax is also referred to as, uh, as Google tax. Um, so if, uh, if I have a local Google operation in the UK which gets cost plus at this moment, uh, you, your recommendation could be why don't you give the local entity uh, compensation for its OPEX plus a, uh, in, uh, let's assume Google earns five cents per, per click, uh, per sponsored click, then uh, if you could support that one cent of that is, is provided on top of the OPEX to the UK entity uh, as a sort of profit split. Would that, yeah. uh, I think you, you would probably give the same answer, but assuming that is fully uh, backed up by economics and, and legal references, um, would that potentially then eliminate this, this uh, diverted profit tax with, with the hurdles around it? I think that I think it's 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 one approach to take. Um, the issue is that, as I said, you're told to disregard transfer pricing. So how do you assess what's just and reasonable? Now, if you have applied not a second transfer pricing methodology and have ended up with the same result or maybe a slightly different result, uh, perhaps with even a lower result, then you can reduce your your allocation to the UK. Uh, I think if you've applied two transfer pricing pricing methodologies then your, is that, my view is that would be a just and reasonable approach to take, but it, it really comes down to what the view of the revenue is, and unfortunately there's not enough information in the HMRC guidance on this. And one, one thing that I'd, I'd like to comment in, in relation to Google now, I, I don't profess to know their structure um, in, in any detail, but based on the uh, avoided PE definition, so is it reasonable to assume that the foreign company and the UK company have taken steps to, uh, or, uh, that are designed to prevent the foreign company from having a UK PE. Clearly, the Google-type structure is potentially within that. But having read through the guidance, as we did earlier, question whether it would still be caught. And, and that's the real issue here, is that you've got this really wide guidance. You've got a, one example uh, of this principal LRD structure that doesn't quite fit, well, it doesn't fit with, with Google's um, uh, business sector necessarily, 
And um, so how do you how do you apply it? How do you are groups to try and shoehorn themselves into the HMRC guidance? Um, I don't think that's going to provide any certainty. So uh, I, I really do. I'm really not sure how whether Google would even be caught by this based on the the guidance uh, that has come out. So. It's interesting. I think it is a question for, for the, the local CRM and specialist CPT team. Should we go on to the next slide? Yeah, just before we go on to the next slide, uh, can I remind the audience, uh, just use the, the GoToMeeting uh, uh, question box if you have any questions. There's, there's already a few questions. Uh, uh, shared with you, but uh, feel free to uh, to pose your question there. Go ahead, uh, Zoe. Okay, so uh, reporting. Um, you might conclude that charging provision one or two do not apply, in which case then there's, there's no reporting requirement. Um, or you might conclude that they do apply, but no diverted profits tax charge arises, and in that case you must still report. And, the reporting requirement is that you must notify HMRC uh, within six months of the accounting period end in this first year, and then thereafter you've got three months from the end of the accounting period to notify HMRC as to whether you think this applies or not. And, and this is something that will need to be considered on a on a yearly basis. Now, of course, if groups aren't, aren't changing things too much, um, then the following years. So once you've got the first year sorted and you know where, where you stand and you've planned your restructuring, if any, then future assessments should be a lot quicker uh, if nothing is changing. Um, once you've notified HMRC, then they must review the information available to them and make what they call a best estimate of the tax due uh, based on all the information they have available. So, if they don't have very much information available and you haven't shared your own analyses with them, you are at risk of the best estimate being wildly inaccurate. So uh, I guess that leads us on to the recommendations, which would be to undertake your own DPT assessment, um, speak with your customer relationship manager or the specialist DPT team if you don't have a CRM, um, and think about providing your analyses to HMRC. Now this there will be a balance between providing enough information that you don't end up with a huge tax charge um, at the outset and not providing um, too much, but that you invite a lot, a lot of questions that are unnecessary. Um, of course, um, I should note that once the revenue have made their best estimate of the tax, you're required to pay that tax within 30 days, even if it's not the tax that you actually think is due. Um, and then you have a following uh, another 12 months to essentially negotiate what the actual tax is with HMRC and um, potentially get a rebate of the, the tax you paid. Zoe, who would be actually signing or handing over this uh, notification? I think it would be the UK company, so there's always going to be a UK connection, whether it's uh, charging provision one, you've got the UK company making a payment to a foreign company, and in charging provision two, you've usually got a UK company uh, that's at, whose activities have been restricted, so the foreign company doesn't have an avoided PE. So it's going to be the UK company that is responsible for uh, making the notification. But, but I, I believe that if the tax isn't paid, that the uh, HMRC can go after non-UK companies for payment of that tax. Okay, yeah. And I think that brings us to the last slide. Yes, yeah, so um, the last slide is, is just a, a I really to give you some context for the case studies. We, we have included three case studies that we're currently looking at um, in the slide pack that you can go away and have a look at and hopefully it'll give some more color to the things that we've been discussing today. Um, it's just worth noting that, that one of the, the tax uh, barristers that we were speaking to at the conference on Tuesday, his view was that uh, the, two, the first two case studies, so the first 
maybe consumer goods group and the e-commerce group, his view was that they wouldn't have an avoided PE based on HMRC guidance, so the guidance we've talked about earlier today. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much, uh, Zoe. Um, a, a few closing remarks, uh, also in the light of time. Um, I, I think the uh, um, DTP and the uh, the BAPS regulations actually use the same terms, economic substance and avoidance of PE. Uh, unfortunately, the governments have been uh, at the higher state of confusion when they came with the definitions because they they mean not the same in a in a BAPS environment versus um, uh, a UK environment, which leads to a lot of confusion, unfortunately. And uh, one uh, statement: uh, the 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 lead of Working Party Six at the OECD has uh, has gone out to um, I'm sure the UK. Uh, at an earlier stage, uh, unsuccessfully so far, and, and has been reaching out to the um, the government, uh, the ATO in Australia as well, not to take uh, measures which look like unilateral BAPS measures with a, a fast uh, impact of uh, destroying the consensus amongst the G20 and OECD members. Um, that's that's one uh, closing remark. The, the second one is we see. Um, that a lot of multinationals are currently preparing an analysis of the non-tax financial benefits, especially if uh, if the corporate if your corporate is in a centralized business model. There's virtually almost in every centralized business model with an interaction with the UK directly or indirectly, there is a divert of profit tax uh, portion which requires quantification. And then you get into situations, what would the UK have earned without the centralized business model? Or the other way around, what savings does the UK actually get from the centralized business model? So it's a little bit inside out and outside in type of quantification. Um, one of the audience uh, uh, of, of you today asked whether transfer pricing can save the day. So if you have a holistic view on your value chain, and you have your procurement and your IP in Singapore, you have your supply chain, uh, say, in the, in, in the Netherlands, and your sales entity in the UK, you have that fully supported. Does that get you away from diverted profit tax? The answer is no, because that's two, two different regimes with different mechanisms. And uh, the statement of HMRC is even, they don't know whether that holistic view is going to save the day um, and avoid you have to pay any divert a profit tax. So with that, I, I think um, it's, it's not all good news, but it, it also means that uh, the, the uh, multinationals, especially the ones with, uh, with uh, centralized business models, would need to make their own assessment uh, effectively in, in quarter two uh, at the latest uh, this, uh, this year. Uh, and I would like to ask Zoe maybe to, to give uh, the main three items uh, the, these companies should be looking at um, uh, when they go away uh, from, uh, from this webinar uh, and, and start working on it. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, uh, so good, uh, a good point. Um, what are the top three things that you could, uh, should you do now? Uh, I think the key is is looking at the rules as soon as possible because there really is only a short time frame within which you have to assess whether they apply um, and and if necessary undertake some restructuring or adjusting your transfer pricing. So the first point would be to look at your own facts and circumstances and undertake an initial assessment. Um, the second thing would be to to, well, whether or not you conclude a DPT charge arises, um, you should identify a strategy for documenting your conclusions, uh, any calculations you make, uh, or undertaking any restructuring, or um, quantifying on non-tax financial benefit. Uh, so number two is your, your strategy, and in terms of how you're approaching this, and what evidence you're putting together. And number three is to talk to HRC. So talk to your, your CRM or the specialist CPT team and share your strategy with them as a starting point. So 
uh, not necessarily your conclusions, even though you might have already reached some, but sh share with them the approach that you're taking. Um, try to seek a, um, an initial view on how they think that it will apply because um, they're going, that your CRM in particular is going to be familiar with your structure um, if you have one. Um, you would have probably been through the whole uh, low risk or not low risk assessment that they, they undertake. So uh, they should already be familiar with the, the model that you have and your transfer pricing. So that would be a good place to start, I think. Okay, one one last uh, question. Could you do if you if you uh, do if you prepare that analysis uh, of the non-tax financial benefits? Basically, you're doing a value chain type of analysis with some tweaks to the left and to the right, following the mechanism of, of and the rules of the game. Would you be able to, if uh, HMRC says there's no diverted profit tax in 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 place, would you be able to? quickly convert that with the, t the same tax inspector into a, a, a good set of materials to close an APA on for transfer pricing purposes? Uh, it's a good question. I, I don't think it would be the same inspector necessarily um, that you would conclude the APA with, but it certainly is a good foundation for the material for, for going for the APA. So um, yes, it, it, it's not um, it's certainly not wasted work to um, to look at the value chain in that way. Um, if you, particularly if you can go for an, an APA afterwards. Okay. Well, thanks very much, uh, Zoe and, uh, and Igor. Um, we, with this, we come to closing of our, our webinar. One uh, one question uh, we have left practical uh, is that um, we will uh, put uh, the slides on on the website, and uh, you can download uh, the slides from there. And um, there's, uh, I think this closes the uh, the event of today. We will uh, rerun this event in in May, uh, where we would like to share uh, again more practical uh, knowledge and experience and exposure we got already till uh, till today with uh, with your you as an audience. So thanks very much for attending, and I'd uh, like to see you again in, on our next webinar. Thank you very much. <laughs>